Day that'll be taken by the hand, lead me through the promised land, and that was touring that city. Amen. Someday, some morning, you'll find me touring that city. That's a blessing. Well, take your Bible tonight, if you would, go to Psalm 127, the 127th Psalm. Psalm 127. Five verses in this psalm, and we're just going to read it together in unison. Psalm 127. Once you have it, let's go ahead and stand together, all of us standing to read God's word, and let's begin together on verse 1 of Psalm 127. Ready? Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. Lo, children are a heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate." And let's pray together, shall we? Father, add your blessing, please, to the Scripture here this evening. We thank you, Lord, for the Bible. Thank you so much that we hold copies of the Word of God in our hands tonight. That, Lord, we can study to show ourselves approved unto God. Uh, that you can manifest yourself and manifest your Word through preaching of the Word of God. Lord, we're asking you to prepare our hearts. And, Lord, that each of us would be focused and ready to receive what you have for us this evening through this psalm. Lord, I pray that you'd keep us from distraction, uh, help us to be focused upon you, and I pray you'd use the special, Lord, to help us to do that and to tune our heart to your heart. It's in Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. strength for my journey. I knelt at the cross where Jesus once died for me. And I asked, is this the place where hope abides? And this he said to me. tomb that is empty. You won't find me there anymore. And beyond the tomb is life everlasting and hope forevermore. Then I sought reassurance and I went to the tomb, to the place where his body was laid. And I cried, Lord, help me see, is there hope there for me? And this I heard him say, beyond the cross is a tomb. Is empty, you won't find me there anymore. And beyond the tomb is life everlasting and hope forevermore. 
tomb that is empty. You won't find me there anymore. And beyond the tomb is life everlasting and hope forever more. That's good. Our Father, we bow before you in prayer now this evening. We thank you, God, for a living Savior that we serve. Lord, I'm thankful that when we gather together here, like on a Sunday evening, that when we gather together, there you are in the midst. You promised that you'd be here. So, Lord, I'm praying you'll speak to our hearts tonight. Uh, folks have made the effort to be here in church on Sunday evening. Uh, thank you, Lord, for those who maybe left family gatherings and uh, came out just because they knew they ought to be in church on Sunday evening. Lord, I pray that uh, no one's been disappointed by being in church tonight. Thank you for the good music, the wonderful songs we've sung, the good spirit that's here in this place, and the good fellowship we enjoy as we get together. And now, Lord, we want you to speak to us through your word. We're, we want ears to hear what the Spirit would say to each one of us tonight. And so, Father, open our understanding and help us as we listen intently to your Spirit and your word tonight. Help us, please. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The Psalm 127, have your Bibles open there if you would. You know, home today doesn't seem to be what it used to be. Be it ever so humble, as the saying goes, there's no place like home. But it seems that homes today are places where husbands necessarily don't want to be. Wives are bothered by the kids, neglected by the husband who doesn't want to be there. In fact, we have many children that are running away from home and uh, can't find them, thinking it's better somewhere else. When you think about your, just think about your own life, and I think maybe Father's Day and Mother's Day lend itself to this, and you, when you think about home, you know, what, what do you think about? I, uh, I had the privilege of growing up in a home where, where church was every Sunday, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and, and uh, Sunday dinner was always a big thing. Uh, I know some folks never had a, uh, maybe not accustomed to having a big Sunday dinner. We, we always had a big Sunday dinner, and uh, my, my roots there uh, in northeastern Ohio are more uh, Mennonite, and, and even in the, my great-great-grandparents, probably some Amish in there, and and I mean, our, our Sunday meal generally would be roast and mashed potatoes, gravy, and 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 noodles, and corn. Uh, when I when my wife heard that when I married her, she goes, "You can't have all that starch." And uh, I said, "Well, we did." And uh, it was uh, I remember the Sunday dinners. Uh, but you know, uh, and I think by the way, I I, I remember. Uh, uh, kick the can. Anybody ever play kick the can? Yeah. Kick the can and freeze tag and hide and seek and the ice cream truck coming through the neighborhood and drinking water out of the garden hose. And we live to tell about it. About that. Getting, uh, I remember playing Little League Baseball and, and after every game the coach piled us, the, the, the team, piled in the back of his pickup truck, and we drove to the ice cream place and got ice cream. We all rode in the back of the pickup truck. Huh? It's sad the kids don't get to experience that in these days. Just home just isn't quite what it used to be. And yet sometimes I wonder, how did we, as I mentioned this morning, you know, how did we go from Ozzy and Harriet and Ward and June Cleaver to Marge and Homer Simpson? How did we, how did we get there? Where did, where did, what, what, what did, what kind of a slippery slope did we get on? I think we got there because except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. And I think one of the reasons we failed as well in, in our homes is we, people don't know 
what it takes to build a Christian home. Except the Lord build the house. Now, it doesn't mean that we don't do anything and God does everything. It means that we're, we're looking to Him for our strength and for our help to build our home. But it is going to take some effort on our part. And, and most people are, are pretty ignorant. You might, I hope you're not as ignorant as the fellow who went into the lumber yard and he went up to the guy at the counter and he said, I want some four by twos. And the fellow looked at him and he said, I think you mean two by fours, don't you? The fellow said, just a minute. He walked outside, talked to somebody in his truck. He came back in. He said, yeah, two by fours. He said, okay, how long do you want them? The guy looked at him and said, I don't know. I'll be right back. Walked outside again, came back in. He said, we want them for a long time. We're building a house. Okay? Now, you may not want those guys to build your house. Okay? And, and, but that's about as ignorant as some people are about how to build a spiritual house. How do I build a home for God? How do I build a life for God? How do I, how do, I do that? What, what are the building blocks that I need to build that house? Now, it's interesting. In Psalm 127, if you have a Bible that, that gives a little description, right underneath the psalm, it says a song of degrees, for, did anybody have that in their Bible? For who? Solomon. Isn't that interesting? That Solomon, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. You think Solomon heeded this advice? <laughs> Let's look at Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Can we go there? Look at, uh, hold your finger in Psalm 127 and go to Ecclesiastes. Right after Proverbs, you have the book of Ecclesiastes. Chapter 2. Notice what Solomon said in verse number 4. Ecclesiastes 2 and verse 4. Here he is. And notice, notice how many times the word I is mentioned, okay? Okay, just, just, that ought to jump out at you, but just in case, I'll give you a hint, okay? All right? I made me great works, I builded me houses, I planted me vineyards, I made me gardens and orchards, and I planted trees in them of all kinds of fruits. I made me pools of water to water therewith the wood that brought forth that bringeth forth trees. I got me servants and maidens, and had servants born in my house. Also I had great possessions of great and small cattle above all that were in Jerusalem before me. I gathered me also silver and gold and the peculiar treasure of kings and of the provinces. I got me men singers and women singers and the delights of the sons of men as musical instruments and that of all sorts. And so I was great and increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me, and whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was the portion of all my labor. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought, and on the labor that I had labored to do, and behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit, and there was no prophet under the sun. Solomon, uh, he had everything there that people look at today and say, you need to be successful. You'd have looked at Solomon and said, man, that guy has it all. That guy's got to be the happiest guy on earth. And Solomon said, I'm the most miserable guy you ever met. Because he realized that except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain to build it. It all comes to nothing. It all ends up emptiness. And, and, and he understood that. And, and I wonder how many times in his life he recalled this song that David tried to teach him. And when he got all the strange wives and they turned his heart away from God and he did everything on his own. I did this and I did that and I got this. Nothing I wanted, I withheld my eye. Anything my eye saw and wanted, I got. We think, we think that's it, man. To have all the money you want that anything you see you can buy. And Solomon said, I had all that. It's empty. It's emptiness. So except the Lord build the house, 
They labor in vain that build it. Now, what are some building blocks that we need then for our homes? Okay, I'm not going to be long uh, this evening, but I'm going to give you seven of them. And, uh, and don't worry, I won't spend half hour on each one. All right? But uh, just 28 minutes on each one. But the, uh, the Lord, here, here's, here we go. Building block number one. Are you ready? Number one, building block number one is the Lord. Except the Lord build the house. It always starts with God. It always starts with Jesus Christ. He is the foundation. Other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. You have to have the foundation, uh, the solid, sure, steadfast foundation of Jesus Christ. Uh, in 1963, America kicked God out of our education system. No Bible, no Ten Commandments, no prayer, no mention of God. 54 years ago, uh, I, I'd like somebody to say, how's that working for us? Uh, how's, how's that done? Maybe we ought to go back and, and, and fix something there. You see, when we gave up the foundation, everything crumbles. And our society is crumbled. And, and we're left on, on sand that is shifting. And uh, we, we people trying to figure out what's going on. I don't know about you, but I don't want to do something in my life that's vain. I don't want to do something just empty. I don't want to do something that doesn't matter. I want the touch of God on everything I do. I want the touch of God on my home. I want the touch of God in my life, and I want the touch of God in the ministry. I want God to, to bless everything that I do. Listen, and not for my glory, but for His glory, for His honor, and for His praise. And, and so uh, I, we're not here to live for ourselves. We're here to live for God. Uh, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. They that are in the flesh cannot do what? Please God. Now, listen, we, 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 before salvation, none of us could do anything to make God look good, to bring glory to Him, for, to put God in a good light. That's what glory means, is to put the light upon Him, to, to make them look good. When I, when I give glory to somebody else, I'm putting them in the spotlight. Well, nothing an unsaved person can do can do that. But you know what, you and I, that's why we're saved, is because we have the ability now to glorify God in our body and in our spirit in our body and in our attitudes, which are God's. So we're, we're to bring honor and glory to Him. See, what, what Solomon found out, exactly what David said, except the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watch and waketh but in vain. Notice what he said in verse 2, It's vain for you to rise up early, sit up late, eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. Hey, you're getting up early, you're staying up late, you're grinding it out, you're doing all you can to try to make ends meet, and the ends still don't meet. And you get frustrated, and people end up saying, what's it all about anyway? What, it's not worth it. I mean, I do all this, and I work in the bone, and i got nothing to show for it. And people feel that way. You have to allow the Lord to build the house. You have to have God first as your foundation. But if you try to do it without God, you will fail you will end up saying there's nothing to this, nothing to it at all. And so, you know, occasionally we have an occasion for people to call and they want to know if, if they can get married here. Sometimes I ask if I'll marry them. Now, I, I try to have an appointment with them and, and have them come in and meet with them because I want to give them the gospel. If I can, I'll try to get them saved. But the truth of the matter is, sometimes I've, I've talked to people in those situations and, and I said, now listen, you don't go to church anywhere. No, and sometimes they'll profess to know Christ. Say, but you're not going to church anywhere, no. And, and, you know, they have no plans to go to church after they're saved. No plans to begin to live for God once they become husband and wife. And the obvious question then is, why would you want to get married to church? If, if, if Jesus Christ is not part of your life now, and you don't intend for him to be part of your life after you're married, why do you want him to be part of your wedding ceremony? You understand? Not, not being mean, just being realistic. You see, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. And so uh, marriage, listen, it, your marriage isn't going to work if you leave God at the altar. If you leave Christ out of it. He's the foundation. that'll make the, the, the secret to making your marriage work isn't compatibility. It isn't, it isn't similar interests. It isn't uh, likes, it isn't even love. It's Jesus Christ. He's the foundation. You try to do it without Him and it's sinking sand. It's held together by 
God. Do things His way. Build your life His way. Build your life based on His words, His instructions, His manual for success. Okay? The very first block is the Lord. First block is the Lord. Good. You've got one so far, okay? Number two. Number two is the leader. The second block is the leader. The Bible says in Ephesians 5 and verse 23 that, that the head of the home is the husband. The man is the head of the home. And it simply means your head sets the direction for the rest of your body. The head sets the direction for your home. Fellas, that's our job. We're to set the direction for our home. And the head, listen, the head gets input from the rest of the body, but the head makes the final decision. And certainly you get input from family members and from your spouse, but the truth is the final decision rests with the head. And, and you're accountable to God for those decisions. And so the direction, by the way, fellas, is always to go the way God says to go. The direction is always the direction God says you should take. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And so he delighteth in his way. And so you want to go the way God tells you to go. Listen, no wife ever had a problem submitting to a husband that she knew walked with God. No wife ever had a problem submitting to a husband when she knew that he walked with God. Now, uh, you ever think about Abraham? When, turn over to 1 Peter 3, would you please? 1 Peter 3. You ever think about Abraham when God called Abraham to go? You remember the story? And he said, you need to leave Ur of the Chaldees and I want you to travel to a land that I'll tell you later where it is. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine if you just went to your wife and said, Honey, we got to start packing up. We're moving. She goes, Oh, okay. Where are we moving to? I don't know. Just pack up. Well, you got to have some idea. No. No idea. God just said, told us to move. Well, how's that going to, you know, you'd have, you'd, have, you'd have more questions than you would answers. And any wife would be that. How, how in the world did he get Sarah to get up and leave and, and take everything and just travel, not knowing where they're going? I think the key, look at First, first Peter chapter 3. Notice verse number 6. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. Now, that's not capital L. She's not saying, you're God, Abraham. But she had respect to him. Lord is like we would say, sir. She called him, yes, sir. She had great respect for Abraham. Why would she have great respect for Abraham? Look at James, the book of James, chapter 2. James, chapter 2. Notice James 2 in verse number 23. James 2 in verse number 23. Notice what the Bible says. And the scripture was fulfilled which saith Abraham believed God. And it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And he was called. What was Abraham called? The friend of God. Well I guess I could follow him if he's the friend of God. Not anybody in the Bible except Abraham I think was called the friend of God. Can I tell you, husband, the wife won't have any problem following you if she knows you're the friend of God. That's the key. Be the leader. Follow God's direction. Encourage your husband, ladies, and pray for your husband that will follow God and that will love God and that will please God. But Husbands, you lead the family in Bible. You lead the family in prayer. You lead the family to church. You lead the family to witness and to be soul winners. You lead the family spiritually. You lead them into a right relationship with God. She can't follow you if you're not leading. Okay? You have to lead. You have to, you, you're the head. You have to set the direction. When someone's, when someone's in first place in the race, we say they are 
ahead. They're in the lead. Okay? That's where you're supposed to be. Okay? You don't lead by pushing. You lead by being ahead of folks and bringing them along with you. Okay? So you have to have the Lord and you have to have a leader. That's the husband. Okay? Lord, leader. Let me give you number three. Back to Psalm 127. Verse number three. Children are a heritage of the Lord and the fruit of the womb is his reward. I have to stick with the L's to make it easier for you to remember these, all right? L is little ones. Little ones, children. Children are a heritage of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is his reward. Now if those children are his reward, why do we hear, these kids are driving me crazy? I gotta have a break. Somebody take these kids off my hands for a while. Wait a minute. I thought God said they were a reward. How come we're treating them like a sentence? Like, a, like God's disciplining us with children. No. In fact is, God says your children are weapons. Notice what he said in verse 4. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. He said your children are like arrows. What were arrows used for in those days? Like bullets in our day. They were, they, they were the weapons. Weapons of choice. Said God, God says, one of the weapons you, you have that I'm giving to you to fight the enemy is your children. Now, you have to train them, and you have to teach them, and you have to prepare them. So they'll be mighty weapons. And how do you do that? You do that by teaching them. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 6. You do that by training them. Train up a child in the way they should go. And when he's old, he'll not depart from it. Deuteronomy chapter 6, please. This is what God told Israel. Deuteronomy 6. Notice with me verse number 4. He says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. Now that's, that's for everybody. And that's for mom and dad. And these words which I command thee this day shall be where? In thy heart. And once they're in your heart, mom and dad, here's your responsibility. Thou shalt teach them diligently unto who? Thy children. And how do you do that? Well, you talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, and when you rise up. So you're going to be teaching them when you're walking, sitting, laying down, and getting up. I think he's got the idea you're always teaching. What do you think? you got the idea you're always training. It's all the time. Don't think that, well, we had our family devotions, now we go do whatever we want. See, don't do that. Uh, you're, you're, there's times to teach and there's times to train all day long. There's always, and by the way, mom and dad, training is always going on. Either they are training you or you are training them. But it, training is always taking place. And you have to understand that and be aware of that. He says, Thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand. They shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. Keep it always before you. Keep it always as a reminder to you. And thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. Everywhere you look. Hey, if, if nobody knew anything about you and you didn't say anything to them and they walked into your home, could they tell it's a Christian home? Do they tell by the things you have on your walls? The signs you have, the Bible verses you have hanging? The Bibles that are there? If they, if they looked at your DVDs, would they tell it's a Christian home? If they looked in your music that you listen to, would they tell that's a Christian home? Your, your bookshelf? Your magazine rack? You see, these things ought to talk, they ought to teach. Teach folks about the Lord Jesus. Train your children. I'll say more about that in a little bit. Little ones. So we have the first thing, the first building block is the Lord. The second one is a leader, the husband. Third one, little ones, children. The fourth is the law. The law. Verse Psalm 128 kind of continues the, this whole idea. Notice what it says in Psalm 128. Blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord, that walketh in his ways. For thou shalt eat the labor of thine hands, happy shalt thou be, and it shall be well with thee. 
Thy wife shall be as a fruitful vine by the sides of thine house, and thy children like olive plants round about thy table. Behold, that thus shall the man be blessed that feareth the Lord. It's a law. The law is simply fearing the Lord and walking in His ways, doing what you know is right. You know, the Bible says, children, obey your parents. That's a very difficult verse for them to fulfill if parents never give them anything to obey. Does it make sense that if they're supposed to obey their parents, the parents are supposed to be giving them something to obey? In other words, you don't leave the child with all the decisions. Well, I just leave it up to them. Well, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says you're supposed to teach them the right way. Teach them what's right. Teach them what's wrong. What's not right. Not, and, and by the way, that's consistent. Something cannot be uh, wrong one time and they get punished one time and the next time they do it, you laugh at them and think it's funny. Okay? It can't be that way. You have to be consistent. God is always consistent. Uh, thou shalt, and, and you have to teach, listen, you teach it very clearly. You know what God says? God makes it so clear in the Bible that it's His promises, uh, I mentioned last night at the, the picnic, God's, God's love for us is unconditional. But his promises to us are very conditional. Okay? If my people, which are called by my name, if they humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I'll hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. Okay? That's conditional. We have to do our part. God will do his part. In fact, salvation's conditional. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What's our part? We have to call on the name of the Lord. We have to ask him to be our Savior. He'll do the saving. But that's conditional. His promises are conditional. So we have to teach our children, listen, there are conditions to getting God's blessing. If you do this, you'll get this. By the way, thou shalt not. If you don't do this, this is going to happen. They have to be clearly defined. God clearly lets us know what will happen if we obey or disobey. And we have to let our kids know what's clearly going to happen if they obey or disobey. And therefore, if they disobey, listen, you say, well, you disobeyed. And if you disobey, what happens? Okay, you made that decision. That wasn't a good decision. But I have to follow through on what the punishment is. You see? Don't, 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 don't say one time it, it's a punishment, another time it isn't. And let me, let me help you with something, Mom and Dad. Stop counting. One, two, you better get going. Don't let me get to three. Well, you shouldn't get to three. You shouldn't get to one. Okay? Delayed obedience is disobedience. Delayed obedience is disobedience. Teach them to, listen, if your child's running across the yard and they're heading towards the street and you say stop and you say, I can give you three, one, two, well, they'll be roadkill. Seriously, there'll, there'll be times when you say stop, they better stop on a dime. They better know that I'm listening right away. Because they're about to be in danger. It was interesting yesterday. Um, no adult was even, well, th there were a couple of adults there, but um, there was a big, big bumblebee. You used to call them yellow jackets kind of thing. And they, it, it landed, it was flying under the shutter. It landed right on Isaac's shirt. He's just standing there and thing went right there. And one of the other kids, I think it was Jacob Barham, said, Isaac, don't move. And Isaac just froze right there. And he just stood perfectly still. And then finally, we, we, I think Fred uh, Messer brushed it off and it flew over to the table and then we sent the bee to made, meet its maker. But, um, but, but it was so impressive that when he said, Isaac, stop, he froze right like that. And, and, and you know, he did exactly what he needed to do. Well, see, that wasn't, that isn't, that, now Bob's probably saying, Phew, good thing, no. But uh, that, that, that isn't by accident. Somebody's been trained to do that, to listen and to obey. See, that's what, that's what children need to have. Not, not counting. Delayed obedience is disobedience. You tell, teach your children, this is the way, walk ye in it. Okay? You know, when God was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, remember and he said, shall I hide from Abraham the thing which I'm going to do? You remember, remember what it said about Abraham uh, over in Genesis chapter I think it's 19. 
Let me check that out. It's an 18 or 19. I'm not sure which one it is right now. My, my brain is scrambled. Let's see. Thank you for not saying amen. Yeah, 19 he comes out. 18 he's praying. So it's Genesis 18, verse 19. Notice he said in verse 17 that I can't hide from Abraham thing that I do because he's going to become a great nation. And then verse 19, God says, I know him. What do I know about Abraham? That he will command his children and his household after him. And they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment. That's an amazing statement. God says, I won't hide from Abraham because I know he's going to command his children and his household, listen, after God? No, after who? Him. He said, and I know if they command after him, they're going to keep the way of the Lord. Why? Because I know Abraham's going to keep the way of the Lord. Dad, you can tell him, follow me even as I follow Christ. And then you set the example. You set the lead. You, 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 you know, we used to say, when my dad's home, we say he's laying down the law. You ever have that expression? Uh, dad laid down the law. He told us this is the way it's going to be. And, and if you don't want it to be that way, you're going to meet with uh, some difficulty. And uh, we understood that. So lay down the law. Listen, once the law is laid down, mom and dad, and you understand and the children understand what it is, you know what? There's no need to yell and scream. You don't, you don't go into any courtroom and, and hear a judge yelling and screaming at everybody. You know why? He has authority. And, and, and you don't have, when a policeman pulls you over the side of the road, he does come up to your car yelling and screaming. Why? He has authority. He doesn't need to yell and scream. He simply come and calmly ask you, uh, do you know why I pulled you over? I'm not sure that's what they say, but that's what Brett told me they say. And um, <laughs> he, um, not that you've had any experience with that, but no. The, uh, that is, uh, you know, they, they're just very calm and very, listen, mom and dad, when you're yelling and you're screaming at your children, you have lost your authority. Okay? You, need to be, you can be calm and you can be measured. When it's time to discipline, listen. You, you, we, we sent our children to their room and they waited. By the way, that was for us to make sure our emotions were under control and that we weren't going to discipline them in anger. And it gave them time to think about what they did. <coughs> and you go in there, and we always say, always did, what did you do wrong? Okay, I did this, okay? And what did Daddy say would happen if you did that? This will happen, Okay. Let's take the punishment. It's as calm and as measured as just the way it is. <coughs> I don't like it. By the way, I never liked it any more than they did. If you enjoy spanking your children or punishing your children, there's something wrong with you. That's not enjoyable. It hurts. I understand. You know, you, your dad, yeah, it hurts me more than it hurts you. You know, and you, you always wanted, you, always, you never believed that as a kid. But once you become a parent, you understand what that means. But, but you have to do that. See? Lay down the law. We have, listen, we have a bunch of spoiled brats in our country who, who won't accept things that they don't like or don't go their way. And they want to protest and break windows and smash things and loot and steal and throw a tantrum. And in some cases, worse, go out and shoot people. All because no one ever taught them as a child, you know what, Henry? It doesn't always go your way. And you have to accept that. And, and lay down the law. So we have, we have uh, first building block was the Lord. The second one was leader. Third one is little ones. Fourth one is the law. Fifth one, you'll like this one. The fifth one's laughter. The Bible says a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. You know, the Bible says that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. They're not burdensome. Sometimes people act like, oh man, you guys have to serve God. You've got to go to church three times a week. You know what? That's not a burden. That's not grievous. That's not a, it's, not hard to, it's not hard to serve God. It's not hard to live for God. It's rather enjoyable. See? 
And, and you just make it. It's, am I happy in the service of the king? Am I happy serving God? Or it's like, come on, let's go to church. Come on, hurry up, we're going to be late. You know, he's going to call us if we're not there. Huh? No, 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 no. Don't do that. Let me ask you a question, Dad. When's the last time you laughed in your home? When's the last time you just had fun with your kids? When's the last time you started the pillow fight? Huh? When's the last time you had a wrestling match? Huh? When's the last time you said, hey, let's have pizza and milkshakes? Huh? Now I'm preaching, this guy. <laughs> Finally got on Scotty's level right there. <laughs> In a book called The Anatomy of an Illness, has perceived by the patient, Norman Cousins. Are you familiar with that name at all? Norman Cousins wrote about being hospitalized with a rare crippling disease, and it was diagnosed as incurable. So Cousins checked himself out of the hospital, aware of the harmful of negative effects are effects of negative emotions on the body. He reasoned the reverse was true. So he borrowed in those days a movie projector and he prescribed his own treatment, he, it, which consisted of the Marx Brothers films and old candid camera reruns. And it didn't take long for him to discover that 10 minutes of hard belly laughter would provide him with two hours of pain-free sleep. And amazingly, his debilitating disease, of which there was no cure, he reversed it. His account appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine, and when it did, he received letters from over 3,000 physicians thanking him for putting that in there. Laughter does good like a medicine. I got a message today from somebody that says, can, can a Christian believe the Bible and science? And I said, a qualified yes, or a short answer, yes. And they wrote back, said, what's the long answer, a sermon? <laughs> and I said, no, but you have to understand, science is not caught up with the Bible all the way in certain things. And so when there's a doubt or there's a discrepancy, we still go with the Word of God, not with science, sometimes falsely so-called, as the Bible states it. So laughter, laughter. Someone said, happy is the person who can laugh at himself because he'll never cease to be amused. And be able to laugh at yourself. Have laughter in your house, okay? And think about that. And make your home a place of laughter. Number six, labor labor. I was supposed to be done by now, but it didn't work out. Labor. A carpenter walked onto a job site of a large company and he handed the foreman his job application. The foreman looked over his job application and he'd seen he'd been fired from every job he ever held. The foreman said, well, your work history is kind of terrible here. You've been fired from every job. And the carpenter said, well, yeah. Well, he said, there's not a lot of positive in that, you know. And the guy said, hey, wait a minute. At least you can say I'm no quitter. <laughs> How about this? I read this this week. The notice was found in the ruins of a London office building. It was dated 1852. And it said this, quote, the firm, this firm has reduced the hours of work and the clerical staff will now only have to be present between the hours of 7 a.m. and 6 p.m. weekdays. They've reduced the hours from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday through Friday. Work. Labor. You know, you got a dad and mom, you have to value work. Teach your children to value work. Work is not a dirty four-letter word. That means there's no free rides. 
There's no, I, I don't believe in allowances for kids. If they get money weekly, they ought to earn their money weekly. They ought to have jobs to do. Growing up, you know, my dad traveled some when I was real young, but all through my teenage years, he worked an office job, and he left work at 7.20 in the morning. He'd get home at 5.20 every evening, Monday through Friday, uh, just, just clockwork. And, and, you know, every day I had jobs. I had, I had to make sure my room was clean. I, I had a room, and we had a finished basement, and I had a bedroom down there, and, and, and I had to make sure that, that my bedroom stayed clean, that the outside room stayed clean. We had a pool table down there. I had to make sure it was brushed and it stayed clean. I had those jobs to do. If it was time to mow the yard, I mowed the yard. Uh, I, did, I had to keep those things done. You say, what would you get for that? I got to eat. I got to have a place to sleep at night. Uh, that was just part of being on the team, you know what I mean? Because I was there, and we all had responsibilities. And, and so I, I got, uh, in those days, clothes to wear to school. When I turned 16 and I, I started working, I earned money in the summertime, and that's, I had to buy my own school clothes for that. And I had to budget my money through the year, whatever stuff I wanted to do, that's the money I would use to, to do things through the year. And if I ran out of money by January, I was out of money. He was teaching me the value of work, teaching me the value of money. And I'll tell you what, I was a whole lot more comfortable with my money when it was my money. I sure was a lot less careful when it was his money. And uh, as we know, as our Congress does, it's real easy to be loose with other people's money. But you know what I appreciate? I appreciate I learned how to work. And you can, believe me, you can get other, other pastors that can out-preach me and you can get other pastors certainly out administrate me, but you won't get anybody that's going to outwork me. And I I can work, and and I'll put in the time and put in the hours. And that that came from my dad, I'm sure, learning how to work and teaching me those things. You know, it's funny. Dad, would you remember this? As I think about my dad on Father's Day, you know, you 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 think more about what they did than what they said. And you think about that, Dad. They'll, they'll remember long, long after you're gone, they'll remember more what you did than what you said. And so teach them the value of work. The Bible talks about working in the hand of the diligent in Proverbs and, and the soul of the sluggard. You know, it talks about the, the, the importance of the, the soul of the diligent will be made fat. In fact, I want you to look at a verse over in Ezekiel. Are you okay? Are you all right? Look at Ezekiel with me because I, I want to show you something. Ezekiel 16. Ezekiel chapter 16. In fact, we just mentioned about Lot. Where was Lot living when God was going to destroy Sodom? And God's going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Why is God destroying Sodom and Gomorrah? Yeah, we, how many say it's sin of, of the, the, the sodomy or homosexuality? How many think that's why he destroyed it? That's what most people think. Look what God said in Ezekiel 16. Verse 49. Behold, <clears throat> Ezekiel 16, 49. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. What's number one? Pride. Two, fullness of bread three abundance of idleness was in her and her daughters four neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy five they were haughty six committed abomination before me I took them away as I saw good that abomination could have been the homosexuality or the sodomy but that's number six on the list a lot of other things came before that. And notice, notice one of them was, notice the abundance of idleness. Not wanting to work. There are, I, I, I don't believe there's any reason for anyone to be unemployed in our country. There's jobs out there. But you have to want to work. Okay? It's work. But you can find work. You find, but you have to be willing to work. And so 
Sloth and idleness were the seedbed which led to these other sins in Sodom. I believe it's led to other sins in America. The fullness of bread, the abundance of idleness. And so, teach your children about labor, work. And then the last building block. We have number one. Let's review. Number one, the Lord. Number two, the leader. Number three, little ones. Number four, the law. Number five, ha, 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 laughter. All right, number six, labor. Number seven is love. Love. What's the, the Bible say in Ephesians 5.25? Husbands, love your wives. Titus 2.4, the older women teach the younger women to love their husbands. That is in the Bible. How do you love your spouse and love your children? Well, you love them by encouraging them. You love them by praising them. You love them by forgiving them. You love them by helping them. You love them by giving to them. You love them by sacrificing for them. You love them when, when <clears throat> it's their birthday or an anniversary. You make sure that they get a gift. They get flowers. They get candy. You recognize their special day. And sometimes you just get them something just because. No occasion at all. Just because I love you. We talked about this before, when you're traveling and you're on a trip and you bring something home for your wife or your children, it's not what you give them, it's the fact you thought about them. You were many miles away, involved something else, and you thought about them and wanted to get them something. It's not the price of the gift, it's the thought that, that made it special that you knew you were thought of. Children, children ought to know that no matter where they go in life, no matter how old they get, no matter what road they go down, no matter if they go down the road of pleasing God or if they go down the road of pleasing self. And they go down the road of the prodigal. They go away from God and they end up in the pig pen. They always ought to know that if I go home, they love me there. They love me there. That prodigal knew that his, he, he would be loved if he went home. God loves us, we ought also to love one another. By this shall all men know you are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. Seven building blocks for the home. You can't, you can't build without them. Okay? We have seven of them. They're all L's. Can you get them? Okay? If you get them right, we'll go home. Okay? All right? Number one is the Lord. Number two? Leader. Number three, little ones. Number four, the law. Number five, laughter. Number six, labor. Number seven, love. Seven building blocks. Boy, if you'll keep these in mind, put them somewhere where you can remind yourself, let's make sure we have these building blocks in place. Because except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Let's pray together. Shall we, Father? Take the truth now this evening. Thank you, Lord, for the psalm. Thank you, Lord, for the practicality of the Bible. Thank you, Lord, for giving us what we need to build our homes for you, to build our lives, to bring glory to you. We don't, Lord, I have no desire to, to what I do to be in vain, to be empty. Lord, show each of us here tonight we want you involved in our life. We want the breath of God upon what we do. What we do will matter, not just for time, but for eternity. Lord, the things that my father built into me, and I learned from him, I want to pass on to my sons, and for them to pass on to their sons. One of the men testified at the barbecue last night, six generations now, has been passed down, faith in God, trust in God, live for God. What a heritage. We ought to all desire that. And I pray, God, you'd help us to build godly homes, to build godly lives for your honor and your glory. 
to be a testimony to this world of what God can do. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. wonder how many folks tonight would just say, Preacher, the Spirit of God spoke to my heart about these building blocks for our home. And I sure want to use these building blocks to build a home that honors and glorifies God. Pastor, God has spoke to my heart tonight. Pray for me this evening. Will you slip your hand up, Christian? Say, pray for me tonight. Amen. Amen. Wonderful. God bless you. You may put them down. The Lord has spoken to your heart. I want you to respond to him tonight. I'll pray. We'll stand to our feet. Lisa will begin to play. Bob will sing. You respond to what God wants you to do. Father, thank you for ministering to our hearts tonight. Thank you for the plainness of your word. I pray your will will be done now in every heart and life in these next few moments. Hear our prayer and help us, Lord. Build our homes, build our lives for your honor and glory. With your heads bowed, you stand to your feet. As you stand to your feet, the pianist will play. As she plays, Brother Bob's going to sing. God has spoken to your heart. You respond to him tonight, will you? Oh, to Jesus I surrender. Oh, to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender all. To Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Oh, to Jesus I surrender, humbly at His feet I bow. Worldly pleasures all forsaken, take me, Jesus, take me now. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all, all to Jesus, I surrender, make me Savior, holy Thine. Let me feel the Holy Spirit, truly know that Thou art mine. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Look this way for a minute, if you would, please. Um, we were gone Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. I had a great visit out in Rockford with Andy. Uh, he's doing very well. And uh, Nikki's out there now, for spent out there a weekend for Father's Day. And uh, appreciate your prayers for us along the way. Appreciate Brother Cato being here Wednesday night. Um, Pam Carlton, Pam and Jeff used to come to church here, and her mother passed away. And they had the service Thursday, the funeral service. And, of course, I was out of town. And they had asked if they could use the fellowship hall for their dinner afterwards and said that was fine. And I <coughs> had asked Jeanette Anderson to help with that and kind of just help organize it. And they're, they're, they're handling the food and everything, but we need to make sure things they know where things are. And Jeanette agreed to do that. And I understand Jeanette, who helped you, Jeanette? Was it Mary Lou and Carol? And uh, how, how great it was to get a text from Pam Carlton on Thursday afternoon and just say what a great job these ladies did Amen. and everything was wonderful she was just pleased as could be uh, with what you ladies did and I just wanted to publicly thank you for handling that and uh, it's so good to uh, you know I'm not even here and just give it to somebody and know that it'll be taken care of and uh, you ladies did a great job thank you so much and the family really appreciated that so I wanted you to know that and uh, thanks for taking care of it Amen? Uh, it's just ways you minister to people, and uh, you love folks no matter what. Amen? So uh, that's good. Okay, the sign-up sheet for the picnics down there, uh, sign-up sheet for VBS if you want to help out. That's in the evenings. 
uh, Monday through Thursday. And listen, you're, everyone's welcome to come during evenings. Brother Eddie is doing the program, and Brother Eddie, as you know, now is full-time uh, in evangelism and especially uh, kind of doing almost like family VBSs. Uh, and how many, under, how many enjoy listening to Brother Eddie as much as the kids do? Most of us do. And he has, a, he has good, good lessons and good truth. And so you're welcome to come out uh, each night and be part of that. Of course, we'll all be here on Wednesday as usual. But uh, come on out every night. You're welcome to be here and uh, participate in that. Okay? Let's pray together, shall we? Father, thank you for a wonderful day today. Thank you for your goodness to us. And thank you, Lord, for being our Heavenly Father. There's no one like you. And, Lord, it's been good to be in the house of the Lord uh, today. I pray, Lord, that we would take to heart the messages we've heard. Help us to persevere as we thought about that and studied that in Sunday school hour. Lord, help us to watch, stand fast in the faith, and quit ye like men. To have character, to be a man, to man up to our responsibilities. Lord, help our homes to get right. So our churches can be right. So our nation can get right. And Lord, we pray that tonight we'll build our homes on these seven building blocks that will help us to have homes that honor and glorify you. Thank you for faithful people to be in their place on the Lord's Day. We pray for those who are ill today and unable to be with us. I pray you'll strengthen them and heal them. Bring them back to us by Wednesday night. Dismiss us now with your care and make us mindful you go with us from this place. It's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. It's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. Let's hear you sing it. <clears throat> Here we go. Hey, it's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. It's a grand thing to follow Jesus anywhere and everywhere I go. For it's a grand thing to be a soldier in his army here below it's the grandest thing to be a christian it's the best thing i know god bless you you are dismissed